Matt, welcome. Thank you. Excited to be here. Great to have you on. And like I do so, so often on the show, we have to start with your own personal journey and how it played a significant role into where you are today and what you do professionally. Sure. For sure. Yeah. Happy to dive into that. I, so I'm a physician and Mike, my co-founder and I, we were physicians in an academic center. We were treating patients in the regular medical system. And like most people who have either worked in or been treated in our medical system, we saw that it was broken. It, it wasn't working. We were putting band-aids on things, not really treating root calls and just weren't seeing patients get all that better. While we were doing that and we're kind of frustrated, we also saw though a lot of science coming out around precision medicine and genomics and personalized medicine. And there's been a lot of talk for the last decade on that, but we started seeing a lot of evidence and studies that actually maybe we could start doing this now, delivering personalized medicine. And so being curious, we dove in, we sequenced our own DNA. We really kind of dug into the science and around that time, Mike, uh, had a kind of a difficult medical issue that came up. He found out his lipids, his cholesterol was through the roof, like really dangerous levels. And he saw his doctor, his doctor told him to do a certain diet. He got worse. His doctor then wanted to put him on a statin, which is a standard medication for high cholesterol. We were a little nervous because there is a risk of muscle breakdown and myopathy with statins. And sure enough, he didn't tolerate it all. He had a really bad side effects from that. And as he's going through all of this, when we started digging into our own DNA, we saw a couple of things. First off, we saw that with his DNA, he had all these sensitivities that made the diet that was given to him that works for most people. He needed to be on almost the opposite diet of that. And that's what, and right now in medicine, when you see a doctor and a doctor says, hey, evidence says that this should work. What they're really saying is the evidence says this works for most people, 60%, 70%, maybe 80%. But he was in that minority where he should be on the opposite treatment. We also saw that he had a single nucleotide polymorphism that made him almost guaranteed to get that muscle breakdown and myopathy from the medication. And we were a little angry when we saw this because we thought, why did his doctor not know this? Why did he have to go through that? And then the light bulb went off and we said, well, no one's doing this. No, no practitioners or doctors are practicing this way, but the data is there. And that made us really want to dive in deeper and actually start doing it ourselves. So we started first just with friends, family, other physicians who knew and trusted us. And we started getting incredible results. We had an example that is my grandmother. She had Alzheimer's dementia and she was one of our first patients. And when we put her on this personalized program, according to her genomics, within a few months, her Montreal cognitive assessment actually improved by 25%. And normally with Alzheimer's, you just want to slow the decline. And it was almost an unbelievable turnaround. I saw my mother next because I was worried that she would have these same genetics. And sure enough, she had an APOE4 gene that makes you much, many more times higher risk to get Alzheimer's. And we put her on the program and she also was pretty unhealthy at the time, but within three months, she lost 40 pounds, reversed her insulin resistance. She told me she felt 20 years younger. And I remember thinking, mom, you probably are like at least 10 years biologically younger, even though you're three months chronologically older. And it was those proof points and those kind of anecdotes that really made us leave our academic jobs, the university we're working at and go in and start wild health to start doing this for everyone. Wow. Very powerful. And, and I have a lot of follow-ups to that. First of all, with regards to Mike and his sky high cholesterol. I'm curious what diet ultimately worked for him. Yeah, it's funny. Originally, his doctor wanted to put him on a, a ketogenic diet. And if you look at the data, about 80% of people or so, they have improvement in their bad lipids on a ketogenic diet. When we looked at my genes and his genes, he has all these specific PPAR alpha, PPAR gamma, FTO SNPs that make him really sensitive to saturated fats, which his ketogenic diet is high in. Whereas my genetics, I don't have any of those. So he and I... Like I do what really well on a ketogenic and kind of very animal heavy diet and he's almost vegan. And we have done there some really fun tests where we'll eat the exact same foods for 48 hours to the same workouts and then check measures of inflammation and glucose and, and ketones and all these other things. And when he eats that diet, his numbers are horrible. 
And when I eat them, they're great. And that was kind of the aha moment to us. We were like, you know, I, I always hated talking about nutrition because it almost seems like you're talking about religion to people. Like they're convinced their diet is the best. And what I realized is people are so convinced and have religious views almost of nutrition because they've tried all these diets, they found one that works for them, and they assume because I'm a human, you're a human, you should eat the same thing. And it's not that way. We have so much bio-individuality that there's not a perfect diet for humans. There's a perfect diet for you and for me. And it's the same with many other things in terms of medications, exercise, all of these things. If we look at someone's genomics, we can do much better about telling them what's right for them. Amen. I think you nailed it. I think that's what's so excited, exciting about the future of precision medicine. And, and with that said, you know, e even though we're early innings, so to speak, th there's still so much testing that could be done. It's almost overwhelming. It, what do you think we should really pay attention to? Is it DNA? Is it your lab work in terms of bloods? Is it stool testing? You know, how do you think about testing in general? Because for someone who does a lot of it, it, it can be overwhelming. Yeah. And to make a comment on your early innings uh, comment, I think you're right. Um, a frustrating thing for me is medicine always is about a decade behind the science. So I think we've got more data than people actually even realize because we're not practicing it yet. But to answer your specific question about what tests, in general, you want to do the tests that are going to lead to changes and improve your outcomes. So to get very specific, when we first started, for example, every patient that we saw, we sequenced their DNA, did a really extensive blood panel, did microbiome testing, did all these tests. What we found is things like microbiome testing, while we know there's a lot there, it doesn't always lead to changes in management. And we don't really know what to do with it in medicine really, in a robust way. Whereas I've never sequenced someone's DNA who we didn't find a ton of actionable things. Never done a big panel of blood where we didn't find actionable things. When choosing the test though, I think another really important thing to think about is how they all go together. So combining them holistically. So we want to choose tests where we're going to get actionable things we can do for you, like DNA and blood work. But we also want to not take them in isolation. I think that's a mistake a lot of times. So a ton of tests that are out there, we find genomics and blood work to be the places we get the most actions, but we also get them from real-time monitoring, monitoring devices uh, that you wear, CGMs and aura rings and whoops and so many other things. Okay. So it sounds like DNA and you can 23andMe or the various places you can get that done. Lab work, you can go anywhere. You can wor work with you guys or work with your, your primary care physician, but you can go to Quest, you can get anywhere. And then if someone, where I'm going is anyone can do this because not everyone's going to be able to see you guys. And it, it, for like zero, like what advice can you give you? Cause like lab work, for example, with, with bloods, I get 28 vials of blood once or twice a year, which is just like, it's too much. I'm a little obsessive about this stuff. Like, and I know everyone's unique, but if you had to like generalize, what advice would you give to someone who's like, all right, I'm going to do a DNA test and I want to get some basic blood work. Where, where should they start? Cause I think it can become, again, I think it can become overwhelming. Yeah. And in general, we think of more data as good. So you think 28 vials better than 10 vials kind of thing. <laughs> and, and frequently it is like we wanted this data, but I, tests are really only as useful as the person interpreting them and your understanding of how to apply it to your life. So I see people get this wrong quite a bit. First off, no test is perfect. There's sensitivity, specificity, likelihood ratios. You have to know how to apply it. And no test should be looked at in a vacuum. Just to give you a couple examples of that, the DNA data, we sequence everybody's DNA. But if you take that in isolation, you could actually cause more harm than good. The example I gave of my mother, who had an ApoE4 gene, if you just tell someone that, that could be kind of a defeating thing. If you don't tell them in the context of, we know what to do about it. We've got your blood work. We're going to work on your insulin resistance, these other things. That could be potentially a harmful thing to someone. The same thing with genetics. Like for me, for example, and looking at my genetics, I respond a little better to endurance activity than strength and strength activities. But if I just got that data and didn't know 
basic kind of medical sports physiology and science, I may only do endurance, which is going to be harmful to me. Like as a male over 40, I'm losing muscle mass every year and I need to do a fair amount of strength training. Same thing with vitamin D. So if we get someone's genomics and they have a VDR SNP, that means they may be more likely to need vitamin D, but we also need to know what is their vitamin D level and are they in Florida or Alaska as far as their sun exposure. So the tests, the biggest problem I see with tests is people look at them in isolation. They don't know how to interpret them and they make bad decisions on it. It's not just about what tests to get, but taking them in a holistic view as well to get the most benefit out of them. Got it. You mentioned wearables, heart rate variability, resting heart rate, you know, Aura, Whoop, I'm wearing both of them right now. How do you think about those devices specifically and how we should look at those metrics and hopefully be able to glean some actionable insights so we can do something about them. And then also, how do you think about accuracy? Because I've heard various things about accuracy for, for wearables. We love wearables. We use it with our patients a lot. Yeah, I'm wearing an Oura ring and a Whoop ring and a Whoop um, right now as well. The way we look at wearables is it's more data and more information. It needs to be interpreted correctly. The accuracy isn't always perfect, but they're usually really good for trends. And they're also really good for helping us to do kind of end of one experiments. So for example, with your Oura ring, if we were seeing you, we're talking about optimizing your sleep because of how critically important it is. And you may see on podcasts, a hundred different things to do to optimize your sleep. Well, instead of just trying all of those or doing all of them, we will pick out which ones are most likely to have a benefit. And then we'll do end of one experiment where we look at your Oura ring data for a week. And then we try a variable and then we see what works and we stack that way. So it's more, it allows us to do a more systematic approach in medicine. When we have a hypothesis, we tell you to do something and then we're going to measure the results. Traditionally, we've measured them three months or six months later. We can measure much more quickly and iterate more quickly with the wearables as well. And it also teaches you an incredible amount about yourself. So CGM, for example, a lot of our patients wear CGMs. We don't want them to wear it forever. That's expensive. But if you wear it for a couple of weeks, you get a lot of great insights about what to eat. Same thing for HRV monitoring. So there's these really great real-time HRV monitors that can help you track your stress levels. There's one called a leaf that we've used. With a leaf, it's constantly monitoring your HRV. When your HRV dips below a certain level, it alerts you on your phone and it tells you how to bring it up. It tells you how to breathe exactly your, your inhale, your exhale, and you can watch your HRV come up. So what this does is it trains you first off to be able to recognize when your stress and your HRV drops. You may notice over a week that when you feel a fluttering in your stomach, that's your HRV dropping. So you could recognize it later without the device. You may also learn that doing emails causes your HRV to plummet or certain people walk in the room and your HRV plummets. So it teaches you a lot about what stresses you out, what you can do about it. And then once you have those skills, then you don't necessarily need to wear the wearable anymore, but it gives you an incredible amount of information about yourself. That's fascinating. So let's stay on HRV and resting heart rate for a moment. I think directionally, we all, we all would like, we all would like our HRV to be high and our resting heart rate to be low. And so with that said, in working with your patients, are there some, what, what have you seen? Like, are there some commonalities that certain practices tend to raise HRV, other practices tend to lower heart rate. What have you seen? Yeah, for sure. And it's things that aren't going to be groundbreaking. So resting heart rate, obviously just the more fit you are, that's the biggest thing. It's going to lead to lower resting heart rate. HRV, the interventions we've seen that have the positive impact over time. And we've measured this with our, our patients. We see a substantial increase in HRV over six months, but things like optimizing your sleep, decreasing eating a lot of food late at night, alcohol tends to just crush your HRV and your resting heart rate. Breath work and mindfulness practices have a big impact on HRV over time. And a really interesting one we've just noted is like when people are living more incongruity with what they feel like their life purpose is and just have kind of less stress from that. We've seen people kind of leave a job that didn't fit them to do something more what they're called to do and their HRV goes up a lot as well. So you, you just learn a lot about yourself, the small things like alcohol and eating late versus the big things like just living your 
life, how you're meant to live. Yeah, it, it's, it's fascinating. You, know, you mentioned the, <laughs> what impacts HRV and what I found is exactly what you said. Alcohol lowers it and what, and having alcohol, if you're going to have alcohol, having it earlier in the day is better than late in the day. Also meal timing and size of meal, big meal late at, you know, dinner crushes it. Big meal lunch, not so bad. And then I've also found when I'm truly away from work, like on vacation, when the sun is out wearing my shorts on the beach, my HRV goes through the roof in a good way, like sky high. So you're definitely speaking to me in terms of, look, I think there's as we think about health span, lifespan, how much do you think you know, there's biohacking, you know, what we're talking about, there's the testing, there's the wearables, and then there's, you know, lifestyle, which we both just touched on. You said, you know, being more in, incongruent with one's pur purpose. And so how do you think about, you know, there's the science and the magic. How do you think about the magic piece of this purpose, connection, being in a, a real meaningful, loving relationship? How do you think about that? And are we going to be able to measure that someday? Yeah. Well, you hit the nail on the head when you talked about measuring it. That, like, those things are massive. The reason I think that we haven't focused on them more in medicine is because they're harder to measure, but we're starting to be able to measure it a little bit. Just like we just talked about your HRV when you're living your purpose or you're with loved ones versus when you're um, doing something that maybe you're just doing because it's your job or for some other reason. So I think those things are extremely important. We're starting to be able to measure them. There's starting to be actually a lot more data on them as well. I mean, things like being in nature, we all know that it's incredibly important. It's hard to measure, but we are measuring it. There's a really cool study where they had patients had gallbladder surgery. And they randomized them to be able to look at trees out their window in the hospital or no window and no nature. The ones that could see trees actually got out of the hospital and recovered more quickly. So there's starting to be some studies and data around how important connection and things like that are. Social connection and being, lo being lonely has a higher mortality risk than smoking. So we're starting to see data on it. I think we all know it's important. I think it's um, incredibly important. Mindfulness, a community, things like that. We stress with our patients. If you think about testing today, you've got the, the known knowns, the things we know that are certain, you know, your DNA is your DNA. And then you've got your known unknowns where you could say, for example, stool testing is really interesting, but you know, it's not really accurate right now. And then you've got the unknowns, the unknown unknowns, the things that you say, you didn't even know you didn't know. And so how do you think about those buckets, if you will, in terms of where we are with testing? Like what are the known knowns? What are the things we know for sure? What are the things we know we don't know, or we're unclear about? And then the unknown unknowns is kind of a hard one to answer, but I'll see if you, you unknown unknowns come to mind. Yeah. Yeah. By definition, I guess the unknown unknowns, I'm going to have a hard time talking about, but there are, I think the known knowns are, are things like, uh, hemoglobin A1C. Most people know, uh, what their glucose and maybe A1C is. And we know that by decreasing that we're going to have a positive impact on longevity and your health overall. There's also a lot of known unknowns that I think people realize and hear about, for example, the APOE4 that I mentioned, not most people don't know their genomics, but we know that it's important. So I think we moving a lot of the known unknowns to the known knowns is a really critical step. And that's what testing does for us. By testing genomics, we actually find out all those things you didn't know before. And now we know we can do something about them. The unknown unknowns, I think, is by far the biggest bucket. We have to believe that because we're just the pace that we're learning things and the knowledge base is accelerating is tremendous. So I think right now, today, we know more than we ever did, but I think five years from now, we're going to be embarrassed at how little we knew about genomics and especially the microbiome. That's the place where it's almost like the, the bottom of the ocean. Like we know there's really cool stuff down there, but we don't know what it is. We don't know what to do with it. And soon enough, I think that'll move also to the known unknowns and then we'll test it and then it'll be a no known. So the exciting thing to me is that 
we're moving in the right direction when it comes to those three and we're, we're learning more and more every day. You mentioned H hemoglobin A1C as being important in terms of longevity. What other, you know, if one's doing blood work and again, I know it's hard to generalize, but if you had to pick four other ones, like your top five, that if, if you're interested in health span and lifespan, what, what else should you demand of your practitioner you want that, that you should pay attention to? And I, and I get that it's different depending on family history, whether you're, you know, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cognitive decline, but if you had to generalize, what, what are like kind of the four or five we should all pay attention to? Yeah. And I used team a one c just as a proxy for metabolic health in general. And also that's one we've had in our patients who have diabetes, we see about a 30% reduction in A1C because we really focus on that metabolic health. So metabolic health in general, so your, your fasting insulin, A1C is a is not a great marker, but it's an easy one to measure, but a fasting insulin and also kind of just your glucose tolerance uh, is important. If I had to like say, what is the most important? I think a general framework for that would be to think, what are the things most likely to kill us as Americans? And it's going to be cardiovascular disease, cancer, and dementia. So if I think about those three big buckets, what are the things that affects all of those? And it's metabolic health. So the insulin, the A1C, your your insulin sensitivity, and then it's going to be inflammation. We've you've probably heard the term inflammaging. We say that because inflammation drives kind of all those processes, cardiovascular disease, the dementia, and the cancer. So inflammation, the metabolic health, and then just cardiovascular health in general, some of the like ApoB. Cholesterol is a big, is a hot topic as far as like how important it is, but having really high ApoB or LDLP are going to be negative and going to put you at a higher risk. So those are some of the, the blood tests. And then I have to just throw in there the genomics. I think genomics are incredibly important to identify the risk factors because if you have someone like my mother who has ApoE4, we're going to focus differently for her than we would if, if she didn't have that. We're really going to press on those things that are reducing her dementia risk. So I think genomics, uh, metabolic health, I think if we can get those nailed down, we're going to get a lot of benefit. In, in terms of, I, I just want to get, get specific on a couple of the ones you called out. So hemoglobin A1C, ideally, where would someone want that level to be? Yeah, so we kind of consider perfect and optimal to be right around 5.0. That's a difficult number to get to. In, we consider kind of usually six pre-diabetic, seven diabetic. There's different cutoffs in general. We want to keep everyone below six for sure. In our patients who start out at nine or greater, those are the patients that we see about a 30% reduction. In our patients in general, we see about a 17% reduction, even when they're pretty healthy. So someone who comes in with an A1C of 5.5, a regular physician would say, that's great. We think pushing that down a little lower is probably uh, even better. So we like to keep it under 5.5, kind of our optimal and perfect places would be 5.0, which for some folks, it's just nearly impossible to get there, but the lower, the better in general. I'm a 4.9. You're making me feel good. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and then you also mentioned APOB. Where would you like that to be? Sure. So in general, we think of the uh, cut off of uh, less than 90 as good. There are some people who are really aggressive with APOB and want it to be more in kind of the fifth percentile to 20th percentile. They, they, some people feel like you can't push that too low. And so that would be more in the range of like 50. So less than 90, you're in a pretty good spot. Less than 70, you're doing great. And then less than 50, I think in, in general, we would think of as, as pretty optimal and, and close to perfect. Wow. I'm in like the seventies. I got some work to do there. Cognitive decline is so concerning for so many people. And what I've found too, is, you know, when I was, I'm 47 in my twenties, wasn't even on a lot of things, not part of my radar in my twenties, but cognitive de decline was far from, from something I was concerned about yet, you know, a lot of our people, 
team members here in their twenties and they're concerned about it. I think, you know, it, it speaks to the epidemic we have there losing one's mind, dementia, Alzheimer's affects so many families. If you look at the trajectory, it's quite alarming. And so with that said, you know, you mentioned APO, it's, it's APO4E, right? Or a, a, APOE4. I always get this one me me messed up. Yeah, it's a great question. So it's APOE and then you can have, you can be a two, three or a four. So a two gives you an four. advantage, four puts you at a higher risk. Got it. So the, the APOE4. And so you shared that powerful story of someone, you know, I think it was your mother, correct? My, my grandmother actually had, um, grandmother. Dementia and my, my mother has an APOE4, so she's at much higher risk. So people who have that gene, cause lots of people have that gene and again, without having access to all their blood work, what, what do you recommend? What are the, some of the things we can do if we have that gene to take preventative measures to, to kind of do the best job we possibly can to avoid cognitive decline in the form of Alzheimer's or dementia. There's a lot you can do. And that's the really good news. When I have a patient that has ApoE4 gene now, I tell them, Hey, I've got great news. Like we have found something out that now we can action on. And it's not bad news to hear that you have it because we know what we can do now. We know we can really delay this onset or, or prevent it. So there's a great book by Dale Bredesen called The End of Alzheimer's. And in it, he talks about all the holes in the roof. So I think he has like 30 something different things you can do. Instead of going over all of those, I would say anyone who's interested, read that book. But if I had to summarize the biggest points, it's going to be the things that you know to do already. So sleep, there's probably absolutely nothing more important than optimizing your sleep. If you're at risk of dementia, it makes just a massive difference. Exercise is important for everyone for longevity. It's that much more important for people at risk. It, when you exercise, especially intensely, you increase BDNF in your brain, which is basically like miracle grow for your brain. And then the other big things I would say is focusing on that metabolic health, like we were just talking about, getting that A1C in your insulin resistance improved and anything that's going to decrease inflammation. So inflammatory foods in general, like your gluten or other things like that, sugar, eliminating those. So sleep, exercise, it's the things that we all know, but they're that much more important to optimize when it comes to brain health. And in terms of fitness, is it high intensity interval training? Is it some strength training? Is it just getting outside and moving? How do you think about fitness in general, what's required? Yes. So that would be my answer to which of those, because all of those are, are important. I mean, when we talk about exercise and movement, one of the key components is to keep it varied and be doing different things uh, with your body. The zone two kind of easy stuff is critically important for long-term health. So is the high intensity interval training. That's where you're really going to pump up that BDNF. Being outside is, is going to be beneficial. And then the strength training, like you mentioned, we, for us males over 35, you lose about 1% of your muscle mass every year if you're not actively trying not to. And so that, that sneaks up on you. So all of those are, are critically important. The, it's so important to be able to do it consistently as well. So the thing that I tell folks is keep it varied, but find something you love doing. Because something you love doing, you're going to do a lot more of it. And that's going to be more important than two hits, a, two hits a week, two zone twos a week, and two strength trainings or a regimen like that. More important is to do something you love and do different activities. Amen. I, I wholeheartedly agree. You know, with all the science out there, all the studies happening as we speak, is there anything you're, you're paying attention to where you say, yeah, this is maybe interesting. I'm going to follow this. What science or studies are, are you really watching right now? Well, obviously the genomics, we, we think the future of medicine is personalized, predictive, and then taking AI and really taking the big data and being able to crunch it. And that's what we're focused on. What we're also kind of interested in watching as well, which is a slightly different, is all of the research right now in psychedelics when it comes to depression, PS, PTSD, addiction, and things like that. We we touched on a little bit earlier how harmful to your longevity and health things like anxiety and depression and loneliness and lack of connection are. And that's an epidemic right now. There's just an epidemic of loneliness, anxiety, depression, all these mental disorders. And the, the tools that we've had in the past have not been great 
uh, and there's some really amazing and promising things on the horizon when it comes to MDMA and psilocybin and, and these things that have been missing for a few decades, but they seem to be actually, we're so close to being able to use those tools. So that's some really great research that we're following very closely. And in closing, if you had the one thing to recommend to everyone, regardless of age, gender, that would have an impact on their longevity, what's that one thing you would recommend to everyone? Yes, yeah, so I'm debating among two right now. So I'll tell you that well, we'll take two. We'll take two. Yeah, it's going to be sleep and mindfulness. And I know we've been talking about testing, testing, testing. And I think all of that data is really important, but I think that's kind of the icing on the cake. And that's the last 10%, 10 to 20%. If someone really focused on optimizing their sleep and having a really good mindfulness practice and connecting with others. Those are the two things that I think would have the biggest impact on their, not just their lifespan, but their health span, which is more important than lifespan. Amen. Matt, thank you so much. Thank you.